This week on Jerusalem Dateline, U.S. Secretary of State makes an historic visit to the West Bank, Israel's biblical heartland. Today we're making history again. And Jerusalem hosts the first trilateral meeting with the U.S., Israel, and Bahrain. Plus, a frontlines report on a new democracy in the heart of the Middle East. And the iconic Tower of David Museum gets a renewal. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made history, becoming the first top U.S. diplomat to visit a Jewish community in Israel's biblical heartland. In the Bible, it's called Judea and Samaria, yet much of the world calls it the West Bank and wants it to be a future state for the Palestinians. The visit represented a dramatic shift in U.S. policy. Secretary of State Pompeo's visit to the Jewish community of Benjamin served a dual purpose. In addition to its historic nature, the stop at the Pizagot winery carried a strong business message. Pompeo declared that going forward, products produced in Israeli communities in the West Bank will be labeled Made in Israel. That move changed a decades-old U.S. policy. Pompeo also called the Boycott, Divest, and Sanctions movement, known as BDS, anti-Semitic, and that the U.S. would cut support to any groups participating in it. Pompeo also made the first official U.S. visit to the Golan Heights, which President Trump recognized as part of Israel in March 2019. You can't stand here and stare out at what's across the border and deny the central thing that President Trump recognized that previous presidents had refused to do that this is a part of Israel, a central part of Israel. On Wednesday, the U.S., Israel, and Bahrain marked their first ever trilateral meeting in Jerusalem, the latest milestone in the Abraham Accords. Today we're making history again. This is the first ever official ministerial visit from the Kingdom of Bahrain to the State of Israel. It marks another important milestone on the road to peace between our two countries and peace in the region. Throughout all the meetings, it has been obvious the intention and keenness of all sides to ensure that the peace we are pursuing will be a warm peace that will deliver clear benefits to our peoples. Pompeo emphasized the message sent to Iran. These agreements also tell malign actors like the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, that their influence in the region is waning and that they are ever more isolated in this shall forever be until they change their direction. Also Thursday, the New York Times reported the Palestinians are considering ending the so-called pay-to-slay program to gain favor with a potential Biden administration. This program pays convicted Palestinians in prison and their families up to $4,000 a month for terror attacks, including murdering Israelis. However, Intamar Marcus of the Palestinian Media Watch tells CBN News he feels it's unlikely the Palestinians will give up the program since it's such a part of Palestinian society. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has said numerous times the martyrs and their families are sacred and so are the wounded and the prisoners. Even if we have only a penny left, it will only be spent on the families of the martyrs and the prisoners. As Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced, the new relationships from the Abraham Accords are sending a strong signal to Iran. A nuclear Iran represents perhaps the main threat facing the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East. Now a new report says they might be further along than you think towards developing a nuclear bomb. Before the proverbial link was even dry on the Iranian nuclear deal signed in 2015, Iran has pushed its limits. Slow but consistent breaching of the limitations that Iran took upon itself when it signed the JCPOA in the summer of 2015. Now, it's doing it step by step. While misbehavior like that led President Trump to pull out of the international agreement, Iran's tactics seem to be working. The most recent report of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency discovered Iran now has 12 times the amount of low-enriched uranium allowed by the so-called deal. Retired Israeli General Yaakov Amidro says Iran has a three-pronged approach to a nuclear weapon. 
developing long-range ballistic missiles, enhancing enrichment capabilities, and enriching large amounts of uranium that could be turned into weapons-grade level. In the capabilities that they have today with the new centrifuges, they have only to make the decision. They have all the capacity which is needed to enrich uranium to this level. According to the Institute for Science and International Security, Iran's estimated breakout time as of late September 2020 is as short as three and a half months. That time frame would be early 2021, but that element is just the first of two steps towards a nuclear weapon. The other point is how to assemble a nuclear device. It's not the same how you um, create the device to start the nuclear uh, reaction. That makes the major question. How long would it take for Iran to have a nuclear bomb? I would say that if Iran decides that it puts away all kind of international respect and oversight considerations and, and go fast forward, then Iran can become nuclear, fully nuclear, meaning with the ability to put a bomb on a missile, etc., between three and five years. Well, tonight I'm here to tell you one thing. Iran lied. In April 2018, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went on prime time to unveil thousands of documents taken straight from Iran's secret atomic archives. What we found in the archives is a good answer to all those who said, nah, the Iranians are not serious. The archive gave us a clear picture of very serious project, which was very much advanced. Bergman, the author of Rise and Kill First, a definitive study of Israel's Mossad, says that operation exposed Iran's deception. I am sure that after that Mossad operation, uh, Ocean 11 Jewish style, after that operation, nobody, nobody can go back to the same JCPOA because everybody understands and confirms Everybody, including in closed sessions, the Chinese and the Russians. Everybody now understand that this is, was based on a lie. Bergman notes the Mossad also led a spectacular operation in July that set back Iran's nuclear program for months or more. Someone was able to smuggle a huge tonnage of explosives into the main facility for the assembly of centrifuges in Natanz and explode that and creating damage of severe magnitude to the Iranian nuclear project, which proves again that special operations and agents boots on the ground, on the ground can be sometimes a very good replacement with sending a troop, the troops, the airplane, the armadas and starting a war. For Israel, the question of a nuclear Iran remains a daily exercise. Our philosophy is very clear. We are getting every morning, we ask ourselves, will tomorrow will be too late? If the answer is no, we are going for another day. And when the minute will come, if the minute will come, and we will have to answer ourselves this, tomorrow will be too late, then we will have to ask ourselves, okay, what we are doing. It's clear after facing the potential of a nuclear Iran, Israel has been preparing to answer that question for a long time. Up next, a revealing report on how Turkey is threatening many nations throughout the Middle East. For years, Middle East observers have warned about the expansionist policies of Turkey's President Recep Erdogan. Those ambitions reach throughout the region, all the way to Jerusalem. Turkey is the emerging uh, major threat to the Middle East. Analysts like Seth Fransman say we are witnessing a belligerent Turkey on the move. It's invaded and ethnically cleansed Afrin of, of Kurds and Yazidis and Christians. It attacked uh, last year in eastern Syria and attacked and ethnically cleansed Christians. It's attacked Armenia now. Uh, it didn't do it directly, but it, it basically goaded the Azerbaijanis into war. And it's also been involved in Libya. It sent Syrian mercenaries. Also, Turkey has been threatening Greece every few weeks for the last six months. Also, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, the UAE. I mean, it never stops. One advance came after a deal with Libya for its water rights in the Mediterranean Sea. And the whole point of the deal was to basically use a very poor and weak uh, Libyan divided government and get a deal for all this water rights, which basically mean that Turkey is now sitting astride 
what claims by Greece and the pipeline that Israel wants to build. Erdogan telegraphed his intent to the world by converting the Hagia Sophia, once the largest church in Christendom, into a mosque. Ever since the modern nation state in 1923, that church has, you know, been a museum basically mm -hmm. and free for everyone to gather in. Him just making the decision to turn it back into a mosque basically is a indirect kind of communication to everybody. I want to restore our Ottoman past. After that conversion, Erdogan set his sights on liberating the Al-Aqsa Mosque here in Jerusalem. Then last month he said, in this city that we had to leave in tears during the First World War, it is still possible to come across traces of the Ottoman resistance. So Jerusalem is our city. Fransman says the regional powerhouses of Turkey and Iran share the same goals. I think it's just that you just have to, we have to admit the rhetoric from Ankara today is a rhetoric that looks exactly like the Iranian regime rhetoric. And that's, by the way, exactly what the UAE and other friends, I think, of the US and Israel say, which is that Iran and Turkey are on the same side. It's not the Persian Ottoman Empire, Sunni and Shia. They're both religious extremism. And then the rest, there's other countries in the region that are not that. Erdogan's aggression presents another problem. Turkey is a NATO member, but isn't seen as a team player. Recently, it purchased Russia's S-400 anti-aircraft missile system and aligns itself with the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. It's connected deeply into the European NATO security infrastructure. And I think that that presents a huge challenge. And I don't know how uh, countries are going to extricate themselves. It's a regime seen as hostile to Christians. Two years ago, Turkish officials convicted and then released American pastor Andrew Brunson on charges of aiding terrorism. Now, Middle East analyst Mike Karam tells CBN News Turkey is closing its doors. Basically, his goal to cleanse Turkey of all, you know, non-Turkish Christians, any Protestant foreign Christians that are living, working in the land or involved with the Turkish church at all, they've been declared persona non grata and a threat to national order or th threat to national security. Given its dreams of a neo-Ottoman empire and Turkish nationalism, some believe Turkey might be as much of a threat to the West as Iran. Coming up, an on-the-ground report from one of the most important areas in the Middle East, a new democracy in the region. One of the areas scarred by Turkey's aggressive foreign policy is northeast Syria. In October of 2019, Turkey invaded the area under the guise of ridding the region of Kurdish terrorists. 200,000 people fled the fighting, and it threatened a growing democracy in the region. Nadine Mayenza, the vice chair of the U.S. International Commission for Religious Freedom, visited this region, and we talked with Mayenza from our Jerusalem studio. Well, Nadine Mayenza, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us the purpose of your trip right now. So I came um, to Northeast Syria in my own personal capacity to really understand conditions for religious minorities and also to understand the governance here, how this government that fought to, to liberate these areas from ISIS set up self-governance that has protected religious freedom and gender. How would you describe this region in, in, as opposed to so many other places around the Middle East? Well, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, where I serve as a commissioner, has identified it as having one of the best religious freedom conditions in the region. It's the only place you can change your religion legally. The only place that converts can even build churches. It has really religious freedom conditions that are really unseen anywhere else in the region. I've been there before, too, and uh, met many of the people. How would you describe their mood right now? We know that last year, October of 2019, they went through a horrific war. What's their uh, mood and status right now? Well, they're working to continue to build this governance that has really protected the conditions here. But there's fear that Turkey is going to come in again. And as we've, you know, USERF documented, as has UN Watch and, and Amnesty International, a lot of other organizations, that when Turkey comes in and occupies land, they commit all sorts of atrocities against Yazidis, Christians, and other religious minorities, including killings, rapes, kidnapping, destruction of religious sites. And so what they're seeing is these crimes occur people fleeing those areas and the fear that that's going to continue and, and bring more stability. There's fear that the regime will come in and the regime, although a lot of people believe they've made a deal with Christians to protect them, the way it works in Northeast Syria is if, 
if the regime does come back here, the Christians will be the first ones targeted because they'll be seen as disloyal to Assad. What role do the U.S. troops play there? I know there's not a lot, but what role do they play? Right now, they really play as, as bringing stability. So it's important that, that a small amount of troops are here. Northeast Syria is so unique in that they should be a conservative's dream. They don't need nation building. They don't need America to come here and t show them how to govern, show them how to run a country. They're doing a really good job of this. What they need is for us to keep some troops here, lift sanctions, which Yusuf has recommended, give them political recognition, which again, Yusuf has recommended, and help them to be able to, or allow them, I should say, to just be able to grow their own government, provide um, services to their people, and be able to have a future. And so um, the troops really aren't needed to do a whole lot other than to just be a, a force for stability for, for this moment while they're making this transition, as a state, I should say, in a future Syria, because they, they're not separatists. They don't want their own country. What they want to be is a part of a future Syria. Yeah, and I know they were really the boots on the ground against the fight on ISIS. Uh, thousands of them uh, paid with their lives. So what would you say that people in the United States really need to know about this area? They need to know that this is a remarkable area. They share our values. Um, they are great allies to the United States. You know, this could be the, the most important refuge for religious minorities in the Middle East. You know, and, and the, the thing about it is it's in a, a great situation right now to do that. They figured out how to beat extremism permanently, which is something we haven't been able to do in Afghanistan or in Iraq. It takes governance, of security, and ideology. And what they've done is, is they have governance that they've built that I've seen with my own eyes from the grassroots up, this democracy. They vote for people from a communal level on up. And they have security in the Syrian Democratic Forces, the strongest fighters on the ground. And then the ideology is religious freedom, gender equality, and, and even conservation. It's a refuge for Christians to be able to live and practice their faith. I met with Kurdish um, Muslim converts that were able to build a church. They got a license to build a church. Nowhere else in the Middle East would that be allowed. It's such a small step for the United States to support them, giving them political recognition, lifting their sanctions. People could come here and invest and help build this country or this government, I should say, as part of a future Syria. Um, and they should have to be included in talks for, for a future Syria. It makes a lot of sense, like I said, a conservative's dream. So, I, But I think most people are, are unaware of it. So I was here, hopefully, to, to raise awareness of, of, of what a unique place this is um, for Christians, religious minorities, and also even moderate Muslims who are able to practice their faith here. Nadine, final question. How can Christians pray about the situation there in Northeast Syria? Sure, people can pray for the Christians here in particular. People can pray for the leadership here, for the leadership in the U.S. and around the world. That, that, um, that, that they'll have wisdom. This is maybe the most complicated place in the world with Turkey on the border trying to come in. You have Iran now that is coming. You have Russia, you know, but you also have these people here that are fighting for their own future and they're doing it by themselves. They're not getting a whole lot of support from the international community. This used to be the headquarters of the ISIS caliphate. Three years later, they now have the best religious freedom conditions in the Middle East with, with no one really making them do it. They did it on their own. That should be rewarded, not just rewarded, but that serves our interests, frankly. In the United States, it serves our interests to have our allies here be strong. And so I'm hoping that Americans understand that. They'll pray for them. They'll stand with their brothers and sisters in Christ that, that are here. Um, and, and it's really a win-win for the United States. Well, Nadine Mayenza, thanks so much for joining us there in Northeast Syria. Appreciate it very much. Up next, a look at an historic renewal project at one of Jerusalem's iconic sites. Tower of David Museum. One of Jerusalem's most iconic sites is the Tower of David at the entrance of the Old City. Now this ancient citadel is getting its first major overhaul in hundreds of years. It's seen Muslim invaders, Roman conquests, and the Crusaders. The Tower of David Museum is one of Israel's historic and archaeological treasures. Now it's one of the largest conservation projects here. This is a rare and unique opportunity for archaeologists because we had a lot of questions about the citadel. Archaeological questions, historical questions. Not every day you get the chance to explore a symbol in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's chief archaeologist, Amit Ra'em, oversees this massive project. Suddenly, the stones start to speak, and we, the archaeologists, see things. We document everything. We are excavating. We discover hidden passages, ancient walls, ancient fortifications. It's become alive. It's a huge project to renew this museum for the future visitors. Of course, we're talking about seven new galleries which tell the story of Jerusalem, but it's more than this. It's all 
what you see around conservation of the remains, the ancient walls, the infrastructure of the museum, and hope that soon, when the crisis will be over, visitors will come again and the Tower of David Museum will be ready and update for them. It's a timepiece of Jerusalem. You can see the layers upon layers upon layers and understand the beauty of the evidence, the archaeology and the history together. The combination is really unique. Everyone was here. Everyone wanted to seize the citadel, to hold the citadel. If you want to understand, if you want to learn about the history of Jerusalem, so this is the place starting from the first temple period and ending in modern times. Right now, all the story is right here. The renewal project is uncovering hidden treasures and secrets of ancient Jerusalem. For example, this passageway may have been used by crusaders to escape the citadel. Every time I'm here, I just imagine that in the time of trouble, all the knights, all the crusader knights, all the Muslim knights, running away in this dark tunnel emerging outside the city. The Renewals Project goal is to bring the story of Jerusalem to life. It's the heart of Jerusalem and this place represents everything, all the story of Jerusalem. It's a very unique, it's a symbol of Jerusalem for many generations. So uh, it's a great challenge, it's a great honor. The visitor we will have here the ultimate experience before they enter to visit Jerusalem. You must visit here. Well, take a meet's word for it. The Tower of David Museum is a must-see when you visit Jerusalem. The project will take about two years to complete, but when tourists do return to Israel, perhaps next year, the museum says it will still remain open. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. <laughs>